You were qualified or you qualified as a paratrooper in 1970. Can you tell us about your training? And is there anything that when you look back, and do you say that I'm glad they taught me how to do that? It was almost straight out of school. We were not called up to the paratroops. We were called up to various other battalions. I was called up to an outfit called Six South African Infantry. I'd always been a bit interested in parachuting, and the opportunity came to volunteer to become a paratrooper. The one parachute battalion sent out instructors to do preliminary tests on all the volunteers, and there were a lot. Just from our camp alone, I think we had about 200 who volunteered. They only had space for, for 200 paratroopers, so they had a, um, a series of really stringent uh, PT tests. And they, they weren't terribly difficult, to be honest with you. If you were a reasonably athletic or fit person, you, you could get through them. And we were shipped off to Lumfontein, the home of one parachute battalion. There we started our training. We did basic training, six weeks of basic training all over again, which we had done already at Grahamstown. But of course, the parachute battalion felt that that wasn't up to their standards. So we did it all over again. Then we uh, went into a two-week solid PT course. Basically started at five o'clock in the morning and went on until six o'clock at night, every day for two weeks. And that, that was very hard training. That was running with logs. Everything was done at the double at uh, one parachute battalion. You, you weren't allowed to walk. You ran to your meals. You ran everything. So you got terrifically fit. During that two weeks of PT, we started with about 2,000 volunteers at one parachute battalion. By the end of the two-week PT course, uh, we were down to just over 200. Uh, and it was hard going. You know, a lot, a lot of the troops said, no, I've had enough of this. And then we went into the jump course. Uh, I think it was about, might have been a three-week course. That was a lot of hangar training based on the British system where we had, you know, certain devices in the hangar where you, you learn to roll and fall. I mean, that was most of the, the training. And then, of course, you do um, particular training for the kind of aircraft you're going to be jumping out of. We at that time had Dakotas, C-47s in fact, which is the military version of the Dakota, the DC-3, and uh, C-160, which is a trans-all French aircraft, very much like a Hercules, but it carries the same amount of troops, 64 troops, paratroops. And then, of course, the C-130 Hercules, which is the same size, a very similar uh, aircraft entirely to the trans-all C-160. And you learnt and you learnt and you overlearnt because you really can't afford any kind of stoppages in the door. You need to get the troops out as quickly as possible. We could clear a, an aircraft of 64 people in about 13 seconds. That's out of two doors. But that's pretty fast going, you know, when you've got people fully kitted up with kit containers, carrying their rifles, all the ammunition, water food, etc. You're carrying very heavy and it's quite difficult shuffling down those narrow corridors between the seats and not stumbling and falling out. So th that training was very thorough and very good. So were all the jumps static lines? So automatically you leave the plane and your chute deploys? Correct. And uh, your, your training jumps were all from around about 800 to 850 feet. So they're pretty low. Not as low as a combat jump. Uh, the jump into Kasinga was at about 500 feet. So you, you don't have much time. And we didn't have, in my day, we didn't have steerable chutes at all. So <laughs> what you got was what, what you got. Because of that, you didn't necessarily bump into one another too much in the air either. You know, with steerable chutes, you... You have people coming out with twists and all sorts of things and steering towards each other. So with non-steerables, you don't tend to have as much of that, even though you're exiting very close to one another. Wow, that's amazing. And no, no mishaps along the way. Now, I was going to ask a question. Even with all the jumps you did, was there still an adrenaline rush with every jump? Yeah, to a certain extent. You know, I, I became a skydiver in later years and I did quite a few thousand jumps. All free form, of course. So that's the nearest in my memory. And um, 
You got an, an adrenaline rush, and that's actually why you did it. Some people, you know, just weren't terribly suited to it, but they wanted to do it, uh, and they did it. But uh, <laughs> they sweat blood doing it sometimes. Even today, we have the opportunity, um, usually once a year, to do a water jump um, with the army. But, uh, you know, all the old folk, you know, up to 70 year old, jump out of a Hercules, uh, but over water, so the landings don't, don't hurt as bad. Now, Mark, you jumped at Kasinga. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the preparation for Kasinga and how much did they prepare you? Were you just jumping or did you know a lot about what the operation was going to be about? We knew absolutely everything that the Army knew about the operation, which wasn't a hell of a lot. We did two training camps for Kasinga. Uh, we were called up for Operation Brailoff, which means wedding, a few months before Kasinga. Uh, we did a training camp at the Taba Ranch, which is, uh, joins through the park. And we trained there, well, I think, for about two weeks. We had very accurate sand models of the base we were going to attack. Uh, they had good, pretty good aerial photographs. We knew quite a lot about the camp. It hadn't been approached by, by recce or 32 Battalion or anybody to really recce the site. They wanted to keep it as secret and clean as possible. So everything was known but from aerial photographs. Uh, we more or less knew how many troops there were in the camp. But because it was a transit camp, they were shipping in troops and shipping them out in quite large numbers. Uh, so you were never absolutely sure how many troops would be in the camp at any one time. But we knew there'd be a couple of thousand at least. We, we did some training jumps at Petersburg. The dropping procedure had never been attempted before, certainly not in South Africa, but I, I don't think anywhere in the world, because the plan was to do a box drop around the camp. If you can imagine, the camp was, was more or less a rectangle. On one side was the Kulonga River, which was quite a decent-sized river. And the other three sides were bordered by a trench and bunker system. So the plan was to drop the attack companies, two of them. I was in a company, the, uh, the first attack company, on the river side, between the river and the camp. And the other three sides were simultaneously to be covered by the other aircraft in a, in a box formation. To put a box around a one and a half kilometer square, it was quite difficult flying. And, you know, you, you didn't want an aircraft flying into other parachutes. So we, we trained that. Uh, we did, I think, about four jumps. And it seemed to go all right eventually. We went on that camp and, and then we got a message that security had been compromised. And of course, everybody blamed the troops. As it turned out, we found out many, many years later, when I was writing my book, security breach was in fact at the Silver Mine Communication Center in Cape Town, where a fellow by the name of Dieter Gerhardt was a East German spy. And he had picked up the information about the, the raid into Kasinga, and he passed it on to the Russians, and the Russians passed it on to Swapa. So they knew about it. They evacuated the camp, and uh, that's why the, the op was, was cancelled. About a month later, it was restarted again, because, of course, nothing happens, and uh, we were called up again. Now, of course, a lot of the guys were a bit wary of it. You know, once you, you had a lemon, quite a few of the guys were self-employed, you know, so it's not funny to to have to leave your work for a few weeks and uh, get paid 50 cents a day for it. A lot of the guys were a bit wary of it and, and so on and so forth. So they, they called up the amount that they wanted. But then, <laughs> as paratroopers are, the, the word went around that this was probably not going to be a lemon. So instead of just having 400 troops, about 600 arrived, <laughs> all wanting to go on, on an operation, you know, because it's very seldom nowadays that uh, a paratrooper actually gets to do a combat jump everywhere in the world because so much of the transport is now being done by helicopters. Combat jumps are very rare, and, of course, everybody wants 
to have done one. We went through the training again, very thoroughly with the updated SAM models and showing us, you know, who was where in the camp, where the HQ was, where the uh, radio uh, um, center was, where the ammo dumps were, you know, everything that they could work out from the from the aerial photographs. And uh, we did another couple of jumps at, at the Brug. Then at the end of all of that, when we were all pretty ready, the first date was supposed to be 1st of May, which would be May Day, where we presumed the Swapo would have a big May Day parade, pull everybody in, and we intended to hit them at 8 o'clock in the morning during their May Day parade. But our politicians were humming and high. And they eventually decided a bit late that the D-Day would in fact be May the 4th, which was extension Thursday to the public holiday. Uh, Jan Breitenbach, our commanding officer, assembled everybody on the on our parade ground and said he needed to get rid of 200 guys, you see. And he didn't really have it in his heart to, to pick them up and say, we yeah, bugger off. So he said, listen, guys, it looks like this is going to be another lemon. You know, any of you want to go home, go home now. Pack your bags and, and off you go. You know, the rest of you hopefuls, you know, you can stay, but it's not looking good. So a whole bunch did go home. And as soon as the trucks left, he uh, announced that, in fact, it wasn't going to be a lemon. And those who remained were going to jump into Ksenia the next day. We very quickly packed our gear and flew up Southwest Africa. We overnighted there. When we landed, we landed in the evening, uh, just as it was getting dark. You know, there was six aircraft, so nobody could, could really see how many uh, or what we were. And we decanted ourselves straight into a big hangar. There was a supper of uh, steak and chips. Uh, then we knew this is serious. You know, the army doesn't give you steak and chips <laughs> uh, in an emergency meal just because they think you're nice guys. We went into the hangar, bedded down on the concrete floor, had our steak and chips and a couple of beers as well. We then were awakened about three o'clock in the morning and started fitting shoots and getting our gear together. About 3.30, we, we got into the aircraft and, and flew off to Angola. Question for me, were you apprehensive about the security leak? Did that worry you at all at the time? Not really, no. We had an attitude about ourselves, which was probably pretty foolish, but it had come about by the, the many operations we had done in, in uh, Southwest Africa and Southern Angola up until that time, because all of us um, had been called up for three-month camps every year. This is now eight years after our uh, initial training. So we'd all done quite a few camps. And uh, we were Fire Force, which uh, operated out of the Puma helicopters. And we were called in whenever there was an incident. So if there was a landmine incident or a farm attack or a local a chief had been murdered or something by, by the terrorists, we were called in, follow the tracks, and eventually uh, we were lucky enough to chase down the enemy. We were so confident it was ridiculous, you know, because each puma would carry sort of 10 people. And often we'd be chasing tracks of 20, 30, 40 people. And we're running straight into ambushes, obviously, once they knew we were getting close, they'd set up ambushes. But we were so confident, and with good reason, because we usually would give them a good punch-up. We were somewhat overconfident. You know, I can't speak for everybody, but I'm pretty sure most of the guys, you know, had the same feelings as I did. We felt, no, gee, what a conglomeration, thousands of these guys, and there were 367 of us. And we were very confident that, that we'd take them out. Now, Mike, coming in for the drop, so you've had beer and steak the night before. So it's almost like it's a last supper. <laughs> yeah, but Leonardo didn't paint it. <laughs> so you've, you've got the adrenaline, you're confident, you know your stuff, you've done many jumps. You've got this feeling of invincibility, but you're still coming in. You're on the plane. You're coming in for this very complicated box jump, hoping that the pilots don't stuff up the flying patterns because uh, things happen. Yeah. We know things can happen in combat. They can go awry. 
can you tell us what it was like? What was what was what were the feelings of yourself and the guys, and what were the steps that you went through? Did it just go back to being the the immediate actions that you just got trained to do? This is what we do: we get up, we get get the static line, we get our gear, we're ready to go, out we go. Of course, that that's what good training does: is it makes much of it automatic. Because if you do stop to think, you probably wouldn't do a lot of it. Good training actually stops you thinking. Just before we jumped in, uh, we had an airstrike, which uh, was supposed to take out all the guys on the parade ground. So but they were these anti-personnel bombs, which is basically, it's made up of little round balls. And when it hits the ground, these balls bounce out and theoretically explode. Now, <laughs> the problem was in Angola, the, the ground is very soft, it's like beach sand. So what happened was most of these, these bombs actually sunk right into the sand before they, they exploded. So there was a hell of a shower of dust and sand and et cetera, et cetera. But they weren't very effective because of that. But it was a, a very peculiar situation because we were in the air for a long time, quite a few hours, which doesn't normally happen. It was very, very bumpy because we were flying at treetop level, I mean, really, 100 feet. Um, to to avoid any any radar, we also did a big circle so that instead of coming from the south, we circled you know many many miles, appeared from the north, uh, which was obviously an unexpected uh, side for the enemy. Um, from our point of view, it was pretty uncomfortable. We didn't jump with kit containers. Uh, normally, you have all your kit in a, in a big container strapped to your leg. Now, because we knew we were falling right onto a camp, basically, we had to have all of our equipment immediate to hand. It had to be all strapped to you. I, for instance, had oh, probably about 40 pounds of, of ammunition, four water bottles, a bit of food. Uh, I also had a six pack of, of beers uh, wrapped in a wet sandbag um, because I knew the value of a cold beer in a very hot place like that, especially if we had to walk a long way. And then I had the company medic kit uh, strapped to my leg, and that was bloody heavy. You know, it, it was full of drips, saline drips or glucose drips. I had my rifle uh, with my first line ammunition, plus two machine gun belts, and I had cameras. I had my own camera, which uh, I wasn't really supposed to have, I also had a camera that the 35 mm camera that the army had given me. And I had a Cine camera, 8, eight mm uh, Super 8 Cine camera, which was also supplied by the army. I wasn't really instructed what to take. You, you know, Colonel Breitenbach just said to me, take general pictures. Had I known that we would have been uh, attacked from a propaganda point of view, saying that we had killed. Uh, women and children and refugees and stuff like that. I, I would have taken a lot more photographs to prove the opposite, but I didn't. I, I just took general battle scenes. The, the the photographs that really survive nowadays are from my camera, my own color film. Now the army uh, for their cameras has given me black and white film. So that was only one of my tasks because I obviously had, uh, I was part of the attack company and my main task was to be part of the attack. The, the photography side gave me a, a bit of freedom to walk around the battlefield. Uh, obviously, it wasn't quite nice when I was taking a lot of fire because I didn't do that much walking. Otherwise, I, I had a bit more freedom than, than a normal troop would have had. So there I am loaded up. Because the photo reconnaissance people had got the scale wrong of the camp, it threw out the, the landing zones very badly, in particular for the, for the attack companies, because they were in three aircraft flying in a, a Victor V formation, supposedly between the river and the base. Now, because the scale was about 100% wrong, there wasn't sufficient room for the V formation to fit between the river and the base. So what you had was on the right-hand side, the aircraft was flying over the river, and I was in uh, that aircraft. And the left-hand side was flying over the camp. So <laughs> those guys 
you know, didn't land 200 meters from the camp. They landed right on the camp, which was, was very dangerous. We were trundling along at treetop height, and the pilot had his initiation point, which is the point where he pulls up from treetop height, hopefully to five, 600 feet, and then presses the, the green button on the, on the light to tell the paratroopers to go. But because this, this length had now shortened by, by 50%, he suddenly saw his initiation point was right next to the, the green light point. So he had to pull up very, very steeply, which when you're loaded so much weight, you, you double your weight or triple your weight. You know, just before you're jumping now, everybody's you know, sunk to their knees uh, in the aircraft. And then the green light goes on. So you can imagine there's a bit of a shamble. Very quick exit wasn't quite as quick as it would normally be. Because the scale was wrong, the pilot couldn't get up in time. So we were dropped very much later than we should have been dropped. The other sides didn't do too badly. But we had this problem of this, this river. And when I got up, obviously I had rolled my cine camera when I, I jumped, I think, number seven or something like that. So I rolled the camera as soon as the green light got, went on. As we went out the door, I panned the camera around, looked up at my chute to see that it was okay, and looked down and saw this huge Nile-sized river beneath me, which is exactly where I didn't want to be. And then the anti-aircraft 14.5 cannons, uh, which we didn't know were at the camp, opened up on us. These 14.5s are real big cannons. It's not funny. The tracer going past you and through your parachute and stuff like that. It's not much fun at all. And then you've got a river beneath you and you're trying to take photographs. And because there's small arms fire coming at you because you're so close to the camp, you're trying to unhit your rifle at the same time. So it was a, <laughs> it was a bit of a circus, quite honestly. I was quite fortunate in that I had done quite a few hundred civilian jumps with a round parachute. So I was very confident and quite good at steering an, even an unsteerable parachute. I got on my lift web uh, and the wind was blowing us over the river. So we had to try and steer away from the river and try and steer upwind as much as possible. Eventually I landed but within two or three meters of, of the river. But on the correct side, some guys fell into the river, luckily enough in some places it was shallow enough that they could get out. One guy fell into the river, but he jettisoned his harness and everything just before his feet touched the, the water. So he lost everything. He lost his rifle. He lost everything. But at least he, he managed to swim out. Skilly him on the missing in action guy didn't. So he drowned. And he was a very small guy as well, very light, very small. And weighed down by all of this ammo and stuff, he just went straight down. Because now we had half our company on, on the wrong side of the river and half on the right side of the river. But then we had to find a crossing point, or we didn't have to, they had to find a crossing point where they could now cross the river because, of course, we were worried about crocodiles as well. I mean, nobody wants to wade in neck deep, uh, wade down with Emma and, you know, being harassed with crocodiles. So uh, eventually they, they found a crossing point where they didn't have to get neck deep. They could sort of get waist deep. And they came across, but all of this took time. And our element of surprise was completely gone. You know, we were three, four kilometers down river and we had to assemble and Colonel Breitenbach decided that we weren't now going to come back to where we should have had our start point. Uh, we were now going to attack from a different angle, uh, which was also very tricky because our stopper groups, the other three sides, and it was very thick bush. They weren't expecting anybody to, to come from the direction from which we came. So luckily enough, we, the fire control was excellent because you only shoot at what you can absolutely identify. And luckily enough, the guy stuck with that. We had planned to be in and out within three hours. I mean, it took us an hour to actually assemble and, and to get the attack going. And now we had a fully prepared enemy. They were all in the trenches, in the bunkers, armed up, ammoed up, and uh, we had a hell of a punch up on our hands. So we then proceeded towards the, the camp through very thick bush under fire 
mainly from the three big anti-aircraft guns, which they depressed to, to fire at us on the ground. But luckily enough, they couldn't really depress it sufficiently to get the guys crawling. So if you were crawling, the bullets were, were going just inches above your head, but they couldn't depress it any lower. Wow. So that, that was that was very lucky. But it kept us pinned down because the ground wasn't absolutely flat, you know. So when you've got a slight rise, then you really were in firing distance for them. We were pinned down for quite some time, I'd say half an hour or so trying to take up these anti-aircraft guns with mortars and the uh, guys were basically hiding under their helmets, you know, absolutely flat on the ground. And uh, that, that's when I decided to have my first beer because we weren't going anywhere. And uh, it, it was hot and dusty. It was quite funny, actually, because I grabbed this beer out of the wet sand sacks that was still quite nice and cold. And everybody was like little tortoises under their helmets. And the minute I cracked the beer can, all the heads popped up <laughs> because the sound of a of a beer being cracked open is uh, is unmistakable even in the bush. Uh, so I had to share it with some of the mates. Eventually, uh, one of our guys climbed up a tree to get a better sight of where these anti aircraft guns were. We had platoon mortars. He uh, gave fire directions first bomb smoke because it was very close so you don't want to blow up your own guys with your first bomb so uh, the first bomb was a smoke bomb and it actually hit the closest anti-aircraft gun point blank right in the middle but it gave them a cough and that was all so <laughs> we uh, then put a, a couple more mortar rounds in behind in front and then another direct hit. So once that the closest cannon to us was, was silenced temporarily, by the way, they kept remanning these damn things. You know, every time we took somebody out, uh, they reman it. So they were very well trained to swap us old plan soldiers because quite a few of them could operate those um, anti-aircraft guns. And they're not, you know, they're big machines. They're actually not that easy to, to operate well. And they, they did a, a fine job. Anyway, we could then proceed forward. And then we came to the trenches. And again, they had made a bit of a mistake because when they had dug the trenches, they threw the sand out on both sides. So there was a kind of a, a berm, if you like, right in front of the trench. So if you're standing in the trench, you can shoot out, but you've now got this sand berm in front of you. So you can't depress your rifle to a paratrooper who's crawling up right next to your trench. So we didn't know this at the time, but we said, gee, these guys are not shooting so well. You know, they're shooting high all the time. But it was because they dug the trenches badly. Uh, that enabled us to, to take out the guys in the trenches easier than had they built them properly. We could use hand grenades. We could shoot them from the top. It was still quite a punch-up, but um, it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And once the, the other two anti-aircraft guns been silenced. That was more or less the end of the battle. They started coming out of the trenches with their hands up. We captured, oh, I think it must have been at least a thousand of them. We couldn't take them home, unfortunately, uh, because we didn't have enough choppers to even take us home. We had to do two lifts to get us out of there. So the choppers would fly from Namibia, 250 uh, kilometers, pick us up, go back, refuel, come back again. So we didn't have room to take prisoners, unfortunately, because there were lots of them, and a lot of them were obviously high-valued guys, you know. So we just had to leave them there. Um, and we blew up all the ammo. The um, planned soldiers who were killed were killed in one-to-one -one firefights, really. We had three guys killed at that stage. This could be human was missing in action, but we didn't know that. It was all disrupted. Because we work on a buddy buddy system. You look after your buddy, he looks after you. If he goes down, well, you make sure he gets to a, a field hospital or whatever. Because of the shambles of the drop, you know, uh, Scully's buddy thought uh, he, he must be with B Company or whatever. He was uh, only accounted for once we went back. But the other three uh, were shot in sight of, of their pals and and they were taken to a temporary aid post. We had a doctor who jumped in with us. We ran a, a little field hospital, if you like. Uh, they were, were 
put there until we we evacuated. So once the, the main battle was over, our command structure radioed in to say, okay, you can you can bring the choppers now um, and take half of us out. Each chopper, each troop actually knew which chopper you were supposed to, to go with because each chopper had big white letters, Alpha Alpha or Alpha Bravo or whatever, on them. You knew that was my chopper and you had to go for that chopper. So the first wave of choppers came in to take half of us, and uh, I was supposed to be on the first wave. As the first wave came in, we got a message from one of our buccaneer aircraft that had been circling that there was a column of tanks coming towards us from a place called Tetchamatut, which was about 20 kilometers up the road. We knew that they were there. It was a, a Cuban detachment with, uh, with armor, mainly APCs personnel carrier, but tanks as well. Now, we thought we were going to be long gone by the time they woke up. But because the battle had now stretched the whole day, they were on their way. We had a an aircraft which was jamming all radio communications. So they couldn't communicate with Kasinga. But it was only 20 kilometers away. So there was a whole bunch of air traffic. They could hear the explosions. They, they eventually... They manned up, they hopped into their tanks and their APCs, and they came down the road. While our half our guys were leaving, we got this message that uh, we were about to have to confront 20 armored vehicles. So I decided to stay. I, I saw my helicopter, but I thought, no, this is going to be a big punch-up, so I better hang around to get some decent photographs. So we were left with maybe about 180 guys to take on these tanks. And we had a few RPGs being captured in, in uh, previous incidents. Quite a few of our guys were carrying extra RPG grenades. So we had a few. Uh, we had also laid a W formation of anti-tank mines at the crossroads, which were about two kilometers up the road towards Tetsumite. So thank goodness we laid these anti-tank mines and the first tank detonated one of these mines and blew up. So that stopped the column, which gave us some breathing space. So our, and we had a little anti-tank platoon with the RPGs and some LMGs like machine guns. And they started taking out the, the stationary tanks and, and APC. So we took out quite a few with the RPG. So as one of the armored personnel carriers was, was hit with an RPG, the troops would very quickly try and disappear into the bush and we could take them out with the with the light machine guns. So the, the Cubans got, got actually a hell of a hiding that day. It was apparently their biggest single day loss in the whole Angolan adventure of theirs. We later picked up by intercepting their communications that we'd killed 250 Cubans in that operation, but we didn't kill all of them. And the tanks were, were firing on us, and we had to hold them off until our choppers came back to, to pick us up. Our chief of the army at the time, General Constant Fulion, had flown in with the first wave of choppers to, to view the, the conquered battlefield. And as it happened, the second punch-up happened as he arrived. So <laughs> he, he got a bit of a shock, and uh, he was now in danger of being captured. So he took off all of his rank. There, there was an ongoing battle, and the, and the tanks were now moving off the road. We had landing zones with their helicopters, but now these landing zones came under fire from the tanks. So we had to move the landing zones, and eventually what happened was there was a, a ring, if you like, of, of parachutes who were moving through the bush away from the tanks, waiting for the helicopters to come in. Uh, one of the buccaneers had come back to help us. He'd rearmed at Ondonga, and uh, he came back with rockets. We had a couple of mirages who, who did the job first, but they had so little time on target before they had to go back because they ran out of gas. So this buccaneer, which had a bit more staying time, came in, a pilot by the name of Dries Merer, and he hammered them with, with rockets until he ran out of ammo. But he saw the tanks were still coming. He then approached them up the road at below treetop level. It was an amazing sight because there were these big gum trees 
on either side of the road, and this buccaneer flew below the tree, up the road, straight at the tanks, and he put his afterburners on it. I can tell you, it's extremely effective. And uh, these tanks probably thought they were being taken out with a B-52 bomber or something, because the buccaneer went inches over their hatches, and uh, they just stopped in shock. And he kept doing it. He got the enormous crooks for that because um, they had unlimbered uh, anti-aircraft guns as well uh, and were shooting at him. And his, his buccaneer took, took a lot of uh, damage. He kept them at bay until eventually we heard the, the choppers. It was a bit of a shambles because, you know, a landing zone for a helicopter should be quite open. So people can identify their chopper and run to it, etc. Now... This was in, in Bushveld. So, you know, helicopters were landing, but you couldn't see them or whatever. So the guys that were left were just, you know, running for the nearest chopper and climbing on board. And, of course, the, the close ones were getting totally overloaded. So you, you had the flight engineer telling them to bugger off and go and find another helicopter. So it was a bit of a shambles. But eventually, almost everybody got, got onto the helicopters and, and off we went. Apart from one guy who, who said to his pilot, he said, listen, the, the guy's still on the ground. The famous hitchhiker of Kasinga, a guy by the name of Peter Manderson, who was a sergeant at the time. I don't know where he was or what he was doing, but he had missed all the helicopters. <laughs> and uh, John Church said he would go down under heavy fire now from the anti-aircraft guns and, and the tanks to try and find these guys on the ground. And uh, he did a, a low pass circle around the, the camp and, and saw Peter Manderson hitching a ride and landed and, and picked him up. And that was the last guy out of Katsinga. And John Church, the pilot, got uh, an enormous crooks for that. And on my chopper was the uh, body of one of the guys who was killed, Eddie Backhouse, who turned out to be my future wife's cousin and also General Constant Fulion, the chief of the army. He was sitting in the seat right next to me, and I didn't recognize him, you know. So I looked at this guy, vaguely familiar, you know, but he's got no rank or anything on it. I think he might be the flight engineer or something like that. So, of course, I broke out my beers again, uh, what was left of them, and, and offered him one. And uh, I got the beady high, and uh, uh, no thank you very much. And I offered him a cigarette, and he didn't want one of those either. And I thought, yeah, it's a bit standoffish. And so one of the guys nudged me, and they said, that's constant for you. But uh, he didn't stop us drinking, which was very much against the rules. You know, all smoking in the chopper. Half the choppers went to a place called Ondangwa. And my chopper went to a place called Ianana, which was a camp right on the cut line on the border. And uh, they had beers. They didn't have anything for us to eat, but we, we hadn't eaten the, the small rations we had. So we had our beers and we had our rations. And then we had the roll call. We communicated between the, the two bases where the helicopters were. <clears throat> and on Dongwa reported that I was missing. That makes sense because I didn't catch the chopper I was supposed to catch. But then it it transpired that Scully Human was missing. The guy behind him in the aircraft, the last time he saw him was he said the parachute looked a little bit crumpled beneath him, and that was the last anybody saw of Scully. And we only found out many, many years later what actually happened to him. That was the battle for Kasinga. Can I just say one word? Wow. The way you tell that story without missing a beat. I know nothing about the battle. You had me on the edge of my seat all the way through. The tension, but just the flow. Is just phenomenal, Mike. Just how you've just calmly went through every step. My God, it must have been terrifying. What? How do you? How, how do you? How do you describe the psychological impact that that has? You're so calm and, and collected about it. It's so. It's just you just impressed me in no end. But just the, the psychological aftermath of that. And what is that like? You know, you must remember that all of the South African paratroopers are volunteers. They're expecting this kind of thing to happen. It's not as if you're a conscript and, you, and you're put into a, a situation that you're not prepared to handle. You know, we trained for this. We all wanted to be on a combat jump. The bigger, the better. And, you know, this, this was fantastic for us. 
it was a very different mindset to to a lot of the stuff you hear about Vietnam and Iraq and stuff like that. Not so much Iraq because all of those guys are are professional soldiers, but certainly the Vietnam, um, where you were pulling guys out of high school and, and they really didn't want to go. The enemy wasn't as close to home as our enemy was. Uh, we were somewhat different. Uh, we, you know, we were fighting communism, which we, which we thought was not going to be good uh, for us. From a from a psychological point of view, you know, I I don't know any single instance of of any paratrooper who I was with uh, who who'd been psychologically damaged by this. The propaganda that came out after the battle was. It was upsetting, but in an annoying way, because we were there, you know, we know who we were fighting. We know that we didn't kill women and children. So from that point of view, it was annoying, but it wasn't damaging. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about that propaganda and what you felt about it? And did you speak to the other guys about it afterwards? We, we didn't just in general, we didn't do much speaking about these things. You know what the secrecy uh, laws were. You know, you, you couldn't talk openly about what was happening anywhere because of security leaks on and so forth. I only found out much later how this propaganda thing had been put together because Swapo was very quick to say that we'd attacked a refugee camp. I mean, like within a day or two, they said, oh, it was a refugee camp full of women and children and stuff like that. In the time afterwards, I did quite a lot of research into this. And I found that Swapo were calling all of their camps refugee camps because they were getting money from the United Nations. And if you could convince them that you had a refugee camp, they, they wouldn't uh, fund soldiers or terrorist organizations, but they would certainly fund refugee camps. So it was quite a, a smart trick by, by Swapo to call all of their camps refugee camps. Now, I did some research and I found that, in fact, the, the U United Nations High Commission of Refugees had been asked by Swapo to please, you know, send them money and medicines, food, etc. For Kasinga, the, the UN said, okay, but we're going to come and inspect the camp, which they did two weeks before Kasinga. Now, what had happened three weeks before Kasinga, when uh, Swapa had found out that the United Nations inspector was going, coming to check the camp, they said, well, hell, it's obviously a military camp. It's ringed by, by trenches and bunkers, the ammo dumps, and there are no children, which refugee camps are usually full of children. So they had women there, but they were all women soldiers. So what they had to do was very quickly find some children. They actually hijacked a bus full of school kids from the St. Mary's Mission in Namibia, 250 kilometer, kilometers south of Kasinga, and they ran the bus up to Kasinga. We actually found the bus there, and it's identified with the number plate. It's that bus that was hijacked. So they hijacked these kids. So when the UN came to inspect, they had a look at the camp, and they said, listen, this is obviously a, a military camp, but there is an element of refugees there because they had women and they had children. Okay, so this was just a couple of weeks before before the battle. So it was a very clever move by them. And it uh, enabled them to be somewhat more believable about it being a refugee camp. So this I only found out much later. Also, I had asked our guys, anybody who picked up anything at the camp of interest, let me know about it. And one of our guys had picked up a soldier's notebook and this laid out the entire hierarchy of the camp. And it was, in fact, a, a brigade-sized operation. This really proves much later, 30 years later, that it was, in fact, a proper military camp. You know, both sides were, must have been very annoyed about it because those poor Swapo soldiers who fought like lions, they really did fight well, were now labeled as cowering refugees. You know, so they must have been damned annoyed about it. And certainly we were annoyed about it. Now looking back, is, is there anything that you would have done differently? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have pinched more of the film that I had taken because what happened was when when we eventually landed back at Ondongwa, 
one of our commanding officers from one parachute battalion, came around and he saw me festooned with these cameras and he said, give me all of that. So I was very happy to, to give him the, the army stuff, but I wasn't happy to give him my form of my camera. I gave him those and I gave him, I think, two or three spools of 35 or stuff that I'd shot. And he said, no, what about this camera? And I said, that's mine. And we got into a bit of a fight. I mean, he was like 10 ranks higher than I was. Uh, so eventually I said to him, listen, young Breitenbach, the commanding officer, knows about it. So he said, he's going to talk to young Breitenbach. So in the meantime, I took out the one reel of film in my camera and I had a pocket full of exposed film, uh, which I transferred to my ammo pouches. So he came back and he said, young Breitenbach says you must give me all of that. So I said, okay. So I gave him a fistful of unexposed film. And uh, that was the last I saw of the army stuff, apart from the stills were published in the, uh, in the newspapers before he even got back home. It had disappeared. And that what I think would have been terrific stuff, the, the, the movie stuff, of the jump and the burning camp and, and all the rest of it, gone. Mark, in terms of the camaraderie, what do you think creates all that camaraderie and, and what makes you still stay together after all these 40 years? Once you've been through battle together, uh, there's, a, there's a strong camaraderie there, uh, very strong. But there's a unit camaraderie uh, in that, <clears throat> with the paratroopers in particular, you've all been through that training. You've all been a fire force operating out of helicopters. You've all been in the same situations. And, um, you know, now some of us are, are getting old, getting infirm. Uh, we need organizations. Um, I'm the president of the PVO, which is the Paravat Veteran Organization. So we really are there for the benefit of our guys. We raise money to to go and get Scully back from his lonely grave. So that builds camaraderie, and, and quite a bit of this is, is fairly recent. You know, we only started the PBO just over five years ago. So we're doing good stuff. That's amazing. Mike, thank you for your story. It's just phenomenal. It's a story of training, story of process. It's a story of commitment, passion, and one thing that really stands out for me, there is no doubt. The impression I got from listening to you tell your story is that it, it was never in doubt. You were always going to achieve your objective because you planned, you trained, you believed in yourself and in the camaraderie and the people around you. Your buddies were going to look after you as you were going to look after them. To the point which, you know, what really... I think is the icing on the cake of that confidence and that there was never in doubt is the fact that you took six beers with you for enjoyment because you knew that you're going to be watching a mission that's going to be successful because there's never in doubt and that there, you were already planning ahead that I know I'm going to need a cold beer while this is going on. <laughs> Wow, that is incredible. <laughs> Anyone else would be going in there. In my time in the Army Reserve, they taught us that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, I've now heard a classic case of there are no, what, what's the word, teetotalers in battle. <laughs> 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 you know, that's, that is just phenomenal. Oh, I just think that's incredible. You, you must remember that uh, in a situation like that, you're 250 kilometers behind enemy lines. If you don't win, you walk, and you walk through a country seething with the enemy. So you actually have no option but to win. That's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. I love, I love your demeanor. I love your confidence. And I love the way that you can look back at it so calmly and say, yeah, it was never in doubt. We're always going to be okay. That's <laughs> phenomenal. Thank you. We will now play the last post. This piece of music was originally played in military camps to mark the end of each day and announce that all soldiers should be resting. The last post symbolizes that the duty of the dead is over and that they can rest 
in peace. During this time, you might like to close your eyes and think about all the men and women who have served in times of war and conflict and about those who have died. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.